This is Rogers TV, Barry. Hello and welcome to A Day in the Life. My name is Fred Hacker. I'm your host and your community producer. I want to uh, tell you that this is program number 120 in our series of A Day in the Life. Our series sponsor continues to be Bales Dishaw Holloway, RBC Dominion Securities, and our thanks as always to Kathy Bales, to Michelle Dishaw, and to Jeff Holloway. We also have a show sponsor, Midland Foodland, and special thanks to Sean Freer for his support for this program. I also want to mention, and this is a bit unusual, that the OPP Association, the Ontario Provincial Police Association, have contributed to the MCC in memory of Bill Boyd, the former detachment commander of the OPP in the 70s and 80s, and the father of our guest. So now let's meet our guest. Please join me in welcoming the Canada World Juniors Management Group member, James Boyd. Welcome, James. Uh, good to be here, Fred. Now, James, the idea behind this program is that we try and talk with uh, famous Canadians about their lives, some of the influences, some of the inspirations that they've had in their life. And we kind of do things chronologically for a while. So let's go back to where and when you were born and begin then. Well, I was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And uh, as you mentioned, my father was an OPP officer. And at that time, uh, he was uh, uh, working in Red Lake, Ontario, uh, which, of course, uh, north northern Ontario. So uh, uh, the closest uh, hospital at the time, uh, when uh, the time came, was in Winnipeg. So I uh, never lived in Winnipeg, but was born in Red Lake. And then we migrated south over a period of about five years. We lived in Red Lake. We lived in Espanola for a period of time. And then finally, you know, permanent residence in Midland for uh, 14 or 15 years. Well, that will certainly be uh, be uh, inspiring for many of our guests to learn that Midland uh, became your hometown. Let's talk about your folks. You've mentioned your father. Uh, I know his name was Bill Boyd. I remember him being the staff sergeant at the Midland OPP. Um, what kind of influence did he have in your life? Well, I think all positive, of course, but uh, in, in every facet. You know, he was a uh, he was a sportsman. He was a hunter and, and fisher and, uh, and an angler. And he was uh, he was a hockey coach and heavily involved in sports and uh, really enjoyed hockey in particular. Uh, he was a, uh, a regular member with the Midland Old Timers. Um, he used to play at Midland Arena there. So a lot of the time was spent, uh, you know, in the outdoors, around the hockey rink, going to hockey games uh, and other sporting events. And so uh, he was he was deeply entrenched in the community, of course, not only through his work, but a number of service clubs and, and that sort of thing. So we were a family on the go all the time. And, and uh, usually he was leading the pack. Now tell us about your mom, because a lot of people in the Midland area will remember her because of her vocation. That's right. My mother uh, taught school. So first at uh, Monsignor Castic School, uh, and then uh, in later years at Sacred Heart School. She kind of moved across town there, but she taught uh, kindergarten at uh, Monsignor Castics and then uh, a number of different grades at uh, Sacred Heart. Now, people will be trying to relate whether they knew you as you were growing up in town. So do you mind telling folks where you lived in, in, uh, in Midland while you were here? Yeah, no, no issue there. We lived right up behind the, uh, the hospital, which at that time, uh, there was a wooded area and then uh, Glenmore Crescent was uh, uh, just, just in behind there. And uh, so we lived there for a number of years and then uh, again, made our way a little bit uh, uh, south across Hugo Avenue to uh, Ingram Crescent. So for a number of years, we lived on Ingram Crescent, just behind the Heronia Mall. Now you had a next door neighbor on Glenmore who then followed you to Ingram, who's a uh, uh, fairly famous Midlander. That's right. Russ Howard was our next door neighbor on, on Glenmore. And then uh, ironically, when we moved from Ingram Crescent, Russ and Wendy, uh, bought our house on Ingram. So we were, it was a kind of an association with the Howards at that time, of course, world curling champion. And, yeah. you know, it's strangely enough to us, he was known as uh, the, the golf pro at Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, his, exactly. he, was, he was moonlighting as the, as the world curling champ, but uh, <laughs> that was an interesting little connection there at that time. Yeah. You have one sibling. I have an older brother named Mike and uh, he lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. 
How much older? She's three years older. Okay. Now, how would you describe yourself as a youngster? Uh, full of energy, rambunctious. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I joke with my mother that, uh, you know, I was enrolled in every sport imaginable to burn enough energy, uh, you know, so that I became manageable. But uh, it was, you know, I was always on my bike riding around town with a group of other kids or playing in other sports, whether that's school sports or, uh, you know, middle and minor hockey or lacrosse. Um, but always on the go. People today are always horrified when they hear about the way kids growing up in Midland years ago had sort of the run of the town. And I grew up in Midland and you and I were sharing when we talked earlier about uh, just being out on the streets all the time and our parents never knowing where we were and really not caring because it was such a safe community. That's so, that's so true. And, you know, they described we leave in the morning, you know, this is in the summertime, of course, and, they, and school's out, but leave in the morning on your bike and eat lunch at somebody's house, yeah. you know, and uh, whatever's going on, whether it's a road hockey game or building a fort in, uh, in the woods or, you know, we even, uh, you know, go down to swim off the town dock at times, you know, and then I think now I have a 10 year old, you know, my oldest daughter's 10 and I'm thinking when I was 10 years old, I was riding my bike, you know, across Midland and swimming off the town dock. It's a little bit, uh, seems a little bit wild, but that's the way it was. Yeah. It was, uh, it really was uh, kids of all ages playing together and, you know, pick up sports, whether it's baseball or, uh, or like I mentioned, road hockey, but it really was uh, like idyllic childhood. It was uh, being the area of the shores of Georgian Bay and all that parkland uh, in the town was just a paradise. Yeah, great. Now, you, uh, you had a tragedy in your family when you were quite young. Uh, can you describe that for us? Yeah, well, my father passed away when I was eight years old. So he had, uh, he was sick with cancer for uh, a period of time, but he passed away when I was eight years old. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, James, we talked about this a little bit. What impact did that have on, on you uh, uh, losing your father that young? Well, it's, it's definitely traumatic. You know, that's with the childhood trauma uh, involved there. It's tough to, it's tough to quantify, but, especially when you got a parent that is so heavily involved in every aspect yeah. of, of your life and, you know, in the town. So, um, you know, it's a great, it was a tremendous blow. Uh, fortunately, being in Midland and, and being members of the community there, there was really a, a community spirit that was able to help us through that. And then, in, you know, in subsequent years, um, you know, I probably playing hockey as a kid, I, I traveled as much with other families as I did with my own, you know, with, uh, uh, helping hand, either traveling with the coaches or another parent on the team, or, uh, you know, I, of course, had an older brother that's participating in sports too. So we're pulled in a couple of different directions. So being single parent family from that point forward with all that support, uh, was definitely, uh, very, very helpful. Now you mentioned that you, uh, you played all sports, uh, but there was one sport in particular that I know you, uh, you really took an interest in, and certainly you've been mentioned already your father. So you were involved, as I understand it, in the Midland Minor Hockey Association. That's right. Then that's where I grew up, at, uh, playing hockey at the Midland Arena. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, outdoors, whether it was road hockey in the summertime or in the wintertime or, uh, you know, playing on a uh, frozen ice outside. Uh, any anytime I could, I, that was my, uh, my passion as a kid was playing hockey. I'm going to test your memory a little bit. Do you remember any of the uh, coaches or managers or folks that uh, that were involved in hockey when you were in the Midland Minor Hockey Association? Yeah, I sure do. And I shudder, you know, I sometimes shudder the question because I'm fearful of forgetting someone. Yeah, yeah. You know, with, with so many people and, uh, uh, you know, parent volunteers and, and that sort of thing. But names that definitely stick out because it's come full circle a little bit here. And I'll explain that is. Um, uh, Rick Larmont, uh, was our coach, uh, uh, for a number of years when I was playing in Midland and Rick's grandson, Ethan is now a, a player with the Sudbury Wolves. Yeah. So I now connect with Rick, his son, Mike, uh, you know, Rick's wife, Wendy in the rinks, you know, and so it really has come full circle. Um, but, uh, uh Rick was a, Rick was a, uh, a really great, uh, uh, you know, coach at the time for us group of kids. Uh, Don DeChambeau, who, uh, the late Don DeChambeau, late great Don DeChambeau, yeah. who actually was a principal at Sacred Heart while my mother was teaching there, but he taught, uh, he coached us. Um, Peter Deacon, 
um, you know, whose who's son Jonathan and uh, is is my age. We uh, he was involved for a number of years. Harry Reynolds uh, oh, yeah. lived up in Sunnyside. Uh, Todd's father. Um, you know, there's so many, so many parents that were willing to help out, and and every year different, uh, you know, different volunteers. But uh, again, that community uh, sentiment. It was a really great place to, to grow up playing hockey. And one of the uh, one of the members of our uh, day in the life team, Brian McKell, was was involved in your uh, in your hockey at an early day, and I think uh, you and his son maybe played together. That's right, Jay Jay McKell was a goalie, yeah. and uh, and Brian was Brian was uh, uh, on the coaching staff there for uh, for years. And what I remember about Brian was he had the fancy uh, uh, restored cars and yeah. uh, and uh, always. Uh, uh, these great vehicles, but I was able to connect with Jay a few years later in Collingwood, and you know, uh, it's always nice to run into the Midlanders wherever I am. Yeah, great, great. Now, you also would have been exposed to a little junior C hockey while you were here. That's right. I I was a regular at the Midland Centennials games. Were you? So, yeah. and you know, I usually dropped off on a Friday night or on the weekend to take in the game with a bunch of the you know kids that I grew up with, but some of the Again, back to the Larmont, uh, Mike Larmont, uh, the older brother of uh, of Mark and father of Ethan, now was a was a member of the Centennials. There, I remember uh, going to hockey games. Dave Brissett was yeah. a was a, a very good player at the time, and his son now plays for the Erie Otters okay. uh, in our league. So, um, but I don't remember so much the the individual players, but rather just the uh, the competition, and that was a big thing for us kids, you know when. Penetang Kings against the Midland Centennials in the 80s was really, you know, that was our NHL. That's right. It was great. Now, tell me about your schooling. Where did you go to school when you were in Midland? I went to St. Joe's in Penetang. Okay. Yep. And then uh, uh, from kindergarten to grade eight. And uh, so you would have studied French. Yes. Correct. And how, how is your French? Not good. <laughs> Not good. It, it required a lot of practice. Okay. But I'm working on it. Okay. Um, when you uh, you would have bus to school, then I guess would you? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And uh, you know, from grade six to grade eight, we sometimes made a road our bikes, if you can believe it, from Midland to Penetang. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah, we did. And uh, uh, but yeah, most of the time, uh, bust with the number of students from Midland who at the time were. Uh, uh, going to St. Joe's. Now, there's a story, and I don't know whether it's true, but a story that some days you went off for lunch uh, and and didn't get back to school because of hockey. What's that all about? <laughs> well, so this is uh, this is a true story, and it involves Paul Henry, uh, who right. mostly local sports fans would recognize, um, yeah. being heavily involved in hockey. And so Paul's uh, two sons uh, were at school at uh, St. Joe's at the time. And Paul was, of course, working at the mental health center in, in Penetang, but he moonlighting as an NHL scout. So Paul would come to the school every day with a station wagon, and whatever kids wanted to participate would bring their skates and their stick, and we'd load in a station wagon, and we'd travel over the Penetang arena during the lunch hour. Now, Ron Marshallon was the, the arena manager there, and I don't know what kind of arrangement they had, but we would go and play hockey at noon hour and then return to school, you know, sometime uh, around one o'clock. But... If we had a really, you know, heated game going on, we just wouldn't go back to school. We'd extend the game. And I think now, if that happened now, what would be the repercussions? But somehow this has worked out for everybody. And uh, Paul would bring out Paul would bring out NHL players uh, to uh, what we called hockey on re. Involved Ulf, Ulf Nielsen was one particular oh, yeah. skater. So they come out and play with you. They come out and play shinny with the kids from St. Joe's at, at noon hour. Wow. I remember uh, the famous story I joke with Paul now when I see him in arenas is uh, we thought Ulf Nielsen was uh, Bobby Orr. <laughs> you know, he was that good. He was he was an NHL, you know, player sure. on the, uh, coming back from injury or whatever. But to think that he came out, you know, for an hour at lunchtime and played with a bunch of kids, it's uh, it's pretty special. And that, that went on for years. And uh, yeah. so Paul was a really uh, uh, influential figure when you're talking about, again, about coaches and people in the yeah. community that – really helped to foster a, a love for hockey. Now, you didn't, you didn't stay in Midland, though, unfortunately. You, uh, you, you moved, uh, I guess, for grade nine? Yeah, in high school, moved to Mississauga. Yep. And then uh, uh, end up going to St. Michael's College School uh, mm -hmm. 
in grade 11 and played for the junior A team there, the St. Mike's Buzzers. Okay. Uh, and why did you go to St. Mike's? What was the attraction? Well, for me, it was the, the hockey team. Okay. And for my mother, for my mother is the academics. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, it actually worked out to be a, a pretty good arrangement, but it was a, it really was a, uh, a great year. And it was kind of a springboard into really high level hockey and, you know, the high level. Good, ac good academics too. Very strong. Yeah. Very strong. And uh, that was the one thing that really stood up with the school was they have all sorts of sports teams and they're all super competitive, but the, uh, the pride that all the students took in their academics, it really was a, it was an influential year for sure. Now, at the end of that year, you were drafted into the OHL. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's uh, drafted in the eighth round of the Kitchener Rangers. And at that time, you know, current OHL fans will recognize that it was a, the draft was a year later, it was a midget draft. So drafted in June, went to training camp in August, and you either made the team or you, or you didn't, but there's a short runway there. So fortunate, went to training camp, made the team. And uh, that was the start of the OHL career. And uh, how long did you play in the OHL and, and where? Well, four years total. It was a year in Kitchener, uh, a year in Ottawa with the 67s, and two years in Belleville playing for the Belleville Bulls. Now, the question I'm about to ask you relates a little bit to your current job as the general manager of the uh, Ottawa 67s. Um, I'm always surprised at how much junior hockey players move around. Like these are kids, and they're they're going to school, and they've got associates. Uh, how how upsetting is it? I mean, you went through it as a young person. How upsetting is it to be moving from team to team? Well, I don't, I'm not sure. Upsetting is the is the is the terminology that I'd use. It's okay. It's usually some mixed emotions because if you're moving, you know, to a new team, that team really values what you bring to the table. So okay. you're being welcomed in into a new team that, you know, has, has paid a price for, they've gone out to acquire you and, and they have plans for you, you know? Yeah. Now at the same time, you're leaving a team where you've, you know, you've got friends and, and, and you know, you're entrenched in school and, and uh, you know, you obviously you have those that. relationships. Yeah, you're being uprooted from there, but it's an exciting time to go to a team. And usually that involves an increased role and, and meeting new friends and, and transitioning. So there's support team in place that'll help with ease with that transition. But it really is, a, it, anytime that happens, it really is mixed emotions. You've got, uh, you know, a real yin yang to it. There'd be the feeling that you're wanted by the new team, but there's the opposite effect for the old team. Sometimes that's the case, yeah. And sometimes, you know what, sometimes uh, uh, you didn't fit in with the team before, which is the case, yeah. uh, you know, in one of the particular trades that I was involved in and, and the writing's on the wall that maybe you don't fit in there. And so it's a, it's a new opportunity. It's almost a second lease on, the, on your career there when you get traded, so. Great. Now, following junior hockey, you went off to university. Correct. So I played the four years in the Ontario Hockey League, and then it, I went to the University of Guelph, mm -hmm. and I played there for two years, and then uh, before embarking my coaching career. Why did you choose Guelph? Uh, once again, for, for the hockey, <laughs> and uh, but my, my mother's voice in my ear, the academics. It was uh, yeah. uh, and in hindsight, it was a great choice. It was a uh, uh, it's a tremendous university, and at the time, they were coming off a national championship. Uh, with their hockey team. Marlon Mueller was the coach there and they had a really strong program. So uh, I studied history at Guelph yeah. and, uh, and played for that, uh, that excellent team. And it, it was, really was a positive experience. I was, uh, I was teasing you that, that uh, to be able to spell the name of the team, you'd need a university degree, the Guelph Griffins. Yeah, that should be part of the admission exam. Yeah, <laughs> good for you. Um, so you, you mentioned then after that, you moved on to coaching. Where did, where did you begin, where did you begin your, uh, your coaching career? Well, the last two years I played in the OHL, as I mentioned, was in Belleville. And, uh, so when I left the university at Guelph, I returned to Belleville, uh, for an assistant coaching position. Mm -hmm. And, uh, who was the head coach you're working with? At the time, Lou Crawford, Lou Crawford. So, uh, hockey fans in Eastern Ontario, the Crawford name is kind of synonymous with, with high level hockey in Eastern Ontario. Uh, Lou Crawford played in the NHL himself, right. uh, longtime American League player. Uh, his brother, Mark 
Crawford was coaching the Colorado Avalanche at the time in the NHL. That's a name people would know. Yeah, and uh, Lou Elsa's brother Bobby played for the Hartford Whalers. Uh, and real sports family. His father actually played played for the Belleville McFarlands that won the world championship uh, uh, way back geez, when. So yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, so it was a really and you know it was really immersed in high level coaching there uh, in a unique situation where I'd played with some of the guys in the team. Yes. You know, so <laughs> I was coming back to to coach them. So it was a year of uh, uh, you know observing what's going on and, and learning as much as I could and really, uh, uh, you know, really get my feet wet. Is it unusual for players to go into coaching? How, how many, how many players that you played with, and I'm not expecting you to name them all, but how many of the players you played with would have ended up with coaching careers or management careers? Well, I think, I think the majority are former players. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are, there are uh, management members in our league and even, you know, in the NHL who don't have a hockey playing background. Um, but really I, the one thing that we all share in common is a passion for the game. Yeah. And so, you know, there's differing, there's differing kind of tiers of experience in, in junior. I'm talking about playing wise, you know, in our league, we've got Mark and Dale Hunter, who of course have extensive NHL careers and, you know, played and have managed for years. And then, you know, you've got other, uh, individuals who I'll use that uh, Elmville's Dave Drinkle, for example, who's the general manager of the Saginaw spirit. Um, you know, he really went to school at Laurentian, took sports management and, and, you know, has also become an accomplished uh, executive in our league. So there's all sorts of backgrounds, but the one thing is a passion for hockey. Now, during the time you were an assistant coach in Belleville, um, you were selected uh, at, to the coaching team of the, uh, Canada U18, the under 18 year old junior players. Um, how, how did you come to get that position? Well, Hockey Canada um, identifies the coaches, uh, you know, throughout the league. And then based on availability, they assemble a staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that time I was fortunate to I was able to travel to Belarus. So the tournament was in Minsk, Belarus right. in the spring. And uh, the head coach at the time was uh, uh, Dean Chenoth who Leaf fans will recognize as assistant coach with the team there now. Yeah. Uh, but it was a time, you know, spent a couple of weeks in a different culture and really high level of competition. And, and what, what, does, what does it do for your career to have a position like that? Does it, does it broaden your horizons? Does it get your name known across the, across the hockey world? Well, I think that the key... You know, the, the key thing that you're taking away from it is networking mm -hmm. and the network and not only getting to know other, you know, other high level uh, people in the industry, but it's the, uh, the sharing of ideas, the exposure to some of the advanced technologies that Hockey Canada has available to them. So yeah. it really is, uh, uh, you know, that exposure to really the highest level of competition. So you take little bits and pieces wherever you go and you know, these Hockey Canada events have a lot of those pieces that you can add to your uh, your toolkit. Good for you. Now, your next stop was was a storied hockey team, uh, the St. Mike's Majors. Um, tell us how you got there and what your role was with that team. Well, that's an interesting one. I, when I was in Belleville, uh, uh, we had played St. Mike's in a heated playoff series. Uh, two years previous and Dave Cameron was the coach of the, of the team at St. Mike's. Now fast forward two years and uh, the team in Belleville had been sold and I found myself out of a job okay. and uh, Dave, Dave contacted uh, Dave contacted me and wanted to talk to me about a vacancy. So I of course attended school at St. Mike's, was familiar with the program there and the history around that program. I met with Dave and uh, he really hit it off and accepted the job. So that was, I was uh, brought back to St. Mike's uh, from Belleville. Great. I, I was uh, reflecting on the number of future NHLers who went through that St. Mike's uh, program. Uh, uh, Tim Horton, Ted Lindsay, Red Kelly, Dick Duff, David Keon, Slinky, uh, Walton, uh, Frank Mahovich, in spite of the fact that he wasn't on the list that I looked up, but I remember he was there. And the current coach of the Leafs, um, was Father Bauer there when you were there? No, okay. no, he was not. Uh, 
but the team had, uh, or sorry, the school had, you know, I think six, six hockey teams, yeah. uh, you know, they were made up of the student body. You had the majors, they were an OHL team. You had the buzzers, they were a high level junior A team in the Ontario Provincial Junior League. Then there was a senior team. There was a senior B team. There was a <laughs> you know, junior varsity team. It was just hockey all the time. But Everybody when you walk in, you know, when you walk into that storied arena, they've got pictures of all the NHL alumni and there's hundreds of them along the wall. So that's kind of your introduction. Uh, uh, you know, the first thing you see when you walk into the arena, it's pretty neat. Yeah, that's great. Now, uh, during the time you were there, you went to another uh, Team Canada uh, event, uh, the, on the uh, under 17 group. Uh, tell us what your role was there and, uh, and what that experience was like. Yeah, well, at that time, uh, Hockey Canada would divide uh, the country into uh, regions. And of course, they'd have uh, uh, Atlantic would be a region, Quebec, Ontario, uh, Prairie, West Pacific. And so Team Ontario is appointed the head coach of Team Ontario. So the tournament was in uh, Lethbridge, Alberta. And uh, we, they of course, picked a team of all the uh, players playing in Ontario at the time and traveled to Alberta and played in that uh, uh, World Hockey Challenge. So uh, that was made up of all the Canadian teams and then a number of European teams uh, mm-hmm. that traveled over for this uh, large event, which has now morphed into the modern day World Hockey Challenge, under 17 World Hockey Challenge, which consists of three Canadian teams uh, made up of players all across the country divided into three equal teams. Okay, okay. Now, the next stop really wasn't a move, but it uh, it sounds like a new team because uh, you you then became an assistant coach with the Mississauga St. Michael's Majors. I'm assuming that's the same team just relocated? That's right. We, we played out of St. Mike's Arena there for a number of years, and St. Mike's Arena, you know, I mentioned the storied uh, history of the arena, but it, it really is small. It, it's about a thousand people fit into the arena, so... Um, you know, we had to move into a modern facility. So we moved to Mississauga into the Hershey Center, which is a 5,500 seat facility. Okay. Uh, ported the name and the franchise uh, and just, you know, changed the name from Toronto to Mississauga and carried on. Now you started out there as an assistant general manager and an assistant coach. Um, and the 2011 season was a special one. Can you tell us about the team's fortunes that year? Yeah, well, that was the culmination of, you know, we were working towards hosting the Memorial Cup. So we awarded the Memorial Cup and uh, we built our team so that, you know, the, the, that would be the, the year where we were most competitive. So in that year, um, we had the current NHLers, uh, Casey Zizekas. Uh, we had De- Devani smith Pelly was on that team who NHL fans would recognize. And we had a, really a strong team. And I think between the regular season and the playoffs, uh, I believe that we won 72 games. Wow. That's won 72 games. And, but unfortunately, lost in game seven of the OHL final to the OS Sound attack in overtime. And then in the final game of the Memorial Cup to the St. John's Sea Dogs uh, in a nail biter. So came up short in both of those games, but it really was a special season. Both of those final games were on your home ice too. Both games on our home ice. Although I will, I will mention that for uh, game seven of the OHL final, I don't know how many thousands of fans came down from Owen Sound, but it was like we were playing on the road. The Owen, Sound, yeah. the Owen Sound Attack fans traveled down and uh, and filled the arena, so it was a it was a unique experience. Yeah, they have wonderful fans in Owen Sound. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a it's a real community event. Now, the the following season, you got a promotion. You became the general manager and the head coach of the team. Um, what's the difference between being an assistant and being it? Very different. Uh, yeah, that's, so in 2012, Dave Cameron was the head coach and general manager, and he went off to professional hockey uh, in the NHL with the Ottawa Senators. So I assumed the, the role of coach and GM. Essentially went from providing suggestions to making the final decision. Yeah. So uh, uh, big change there. But a subtle change, but a big change. So, um, but, you know, we had some continuity there, and uh, the majority of the staff uh, 
you know, remained on board. So it really eased that transition. Good, good. It is, and, and I think that applies to any walk of, of life, James, uh, going from being second in command to first in command is a whole different world because you can throw out ideas and it's not your fault that they get enacted if you're a second in command, but the buck yep. stops with you once you're, once you're the head guy. That is true. The buck stops with you. Yeah. yeah. Now the, uh, the next stop was the same city, but a new name is, is that the same team rebranded? That's right. At the end of uh, the 2012, 2013 season, the team was sold. So Eugene Melnick, the current owner of the Ottawa Senators, yes, and St. Mike's alumnus had owned the team, and he sold it to a local businessman named Elliot Kerr. So Elliot Kerr uh, had experience in the league. He was, he was part of ownership groups in Mississauga and Guelph, and uh, but he lived in Mississauga, and so he purchased the team, and uh, the team was rebranded. And with a new name. That's right, the Steelheads, which I was a product of a name the team uh, contest. Okay. And what's the steelhead? What's the significance of the steelhead in Mississauga? Well, there's the Credit River runs through Mississauga. It was really a, a big part of the city's history. And uh, the steelhead uh, trout uh, spawn in the, in, the, in the Credit River. And there's pretty, uh, pretty active angling community there. So that was the winner in the... Uh, the name of the team, but I think it's fitting uh, as, as the river links the city together. Yeah, yeah. So you were the general manager head coach there for, I guess, three, three or four seasons. And then in the 2016-17 season, um, you fired yourself as the head coach. Is that, well, is that, is that the yeah. right way to say it? <laughs> yeah, that's about right. We transitioned in, transitioned into management. Yeah, but... Uh, uh, and, you know, that was a product of the league has evolved over the years where the responsibilities became more and more. Yeah. Just got to a point where I didn't feel we were doing a great job at, at, at either of the, the head coach or the general manager. And probably compounded by the fact that I had two toddlers at home and a young family and, and a lot going on. So just at that time of my life, uh, you know, Elliot and I agreed that uh, you know, my, my strengths are in management. And then, so that's where I focused uh, 100% of my energy. Good for you. Now, um, what, I guess in 2017, the team went to the finals. That team, the Steelheads went to the finals. Can you tell us about, uh, about that team, the strengths that it had and, uh, and, uh, uh, what what the results were? Yeah, well, that was a uh, again. It was, it, was, it was a team that we built towards uh, that that particular year, um, and it was a team of uh, with some real star power. We had the McLeod brothers, who of course from Mississauga, um, and you know we had some, we caught some really exceptional goaltending in the playoffs from uh, Matt Mancina, yeah. uh, but we had some uh, some strong European players and. We ended up meeting the Erie Otters in the league final. Um, who, I mean, fans would recognize uh, uh, Dylan Strom and uh, Alex Debrinket and uh, some current NHLers that play for Erie. But uh, unfortunately, they uh, got the best of us. And uh, so this would the be final. the year after Connor McDavid was in Erie, would it? That is correct. Yeah, that so is correct. He was not part of that team. Yeah. Okay, and. Uh, then you went, you, 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 they then went on to the Memorial Cup, I guess, did they that year, Erie? They did, correct. And, and then lost that series. Yeah. That's right, to the Windsor Spitfires. Okay. Yeah. Then in 2017, you moved to Ottawa. That's right. Uh, what, what prompted that? Well, at the end of the 2017 season and that final against the Erie Otters, I was looking to transition into a new opportunity. So I'd actually had my sights focused on an NHL scouting job and, uh, and uh, you know, taking on that challenge. And in the interim, um, between the end of our season and the NHL draft, I met with the Ottawa 67s and they asked me to take on their general manager's duties, which involved a hybrid concept where I'd continue living in Toronto and commute to Ottawa 
And so it was really appealing uh, at the time. And it's actually, you know, in hindsight, years later, it's worked out uh, uh, really, really well. So, uh, you know, they were they were thinking outside the box and it made sense at the time. And uh, I'm glad that I, you know, the, took the opportunity. The team was very successful in 2019. Um, during the regular season, uh, you won a, is the Hamilton Spectator that gives the award for the top team? That's right. The Hamilton Spectators for the team that finishes first overall in the Ontario Hockey League. Okay. And how did you do in the playoffs? We lost to the Guelph Storm in the, in the league final. Uh, in the Guelph Storm, uh, some of the key players, uh, 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 Nick Suzuki, yeah. a current Montreal Canadian, would Canadian. be uh, yeah. probably the, the player uh, most hockey fans would recognize, but really a strong team. And so uh, we were we rolled along in the playoffs. We won uh, uh, three series and four games straight on the way to the final. So I guess in the, in hindsight, maybe not enough adversity uh, before meeting a really really strong team in, in Guelph in the final. And then the following year, you were ranked as the number one junior team in Canada. Were you not? What, 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 That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in 2018-19, we won 50 games. Um, which was, of course, the league best in in 2019-20. We had won 50 games when the when the season was postponed um, or put on pause and eventually canceled uh, when COVID hit. So it was it was a tremendous season. Of, you know, if we were, if we were to get a I get a crystal ball, of, we we're probably going to be pushing 60 wins that year, which would have been the all-time uh, Ottawa 67s record and probably close to the all-time OHL record. And you got some recognition for the great year the team had. Correct. I was uh, 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 very honored to be awarded the Jim Gregory Trophy, which is for the OHL's general manager of the year in its inaugura inaugural season. So that you were the first person to receive it. And because of COVID, nobody received it last year. So you're still the only person to ever <laughs> receive it. <laughs> I guess that's right, Fred. I'm, I'm the only one who have ever received it. Uh, yeah. But I... I think there's uh, there's some real quality candidates in our league this year. Uh, I, I think it'll, it'll come to an end here shortly. Okay. Now, a name that you mentioned earlier gets reunited with you, uh, and that's Dave Cameron. That's right. That's right. So Dave, of course, uh, brought me back to St. Mike's, um, you know, in 2005. And then, like I mentioned, Dave went off to the NHL and, uh, uh, and then, you know, I continued uh, in the Ontario Hockey League, and then we remained close in, uh, you know, constant communication. When he was with the Senators, I was always kind of hanging around those teams. And then uh, when Dave went off to coach in Europe, uh, after he worked with the Calgary Flames, uh, he coached in Vienna. I traveled to Europe uh, as much as I can to do scouting and, and take in some international tournaments. So I had to connect with Dave when I was in Europe, yeah. uh, in Vienna. And so when the opportunity... Our, our head coach in with the Ottawa 67s, Andre Tourney, took a job with the Arizona Coyotes last summer. I reached out to Dave and, you know, on a whim, maybe he'd be interested. And here we are, he's coaching our team. That's great. That's great. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm not part of the hockey world, but in, in people who are in the hockey world, when I talk to them, everybody knows everybody. Every And, and these associations keep sort of reoccurring. People sort of reunite with people they've been with before and uh, and guys like you remember every player you ever signed to a contract it's a fascinating world yes it, it's it's interesting how that happens with it you know it it's it's extremely competitive and it's an intense environment especially when you get to the Ontario hockey league or even you know beyond but it's it's also a small world at the same time you know you're traveling in the same circles and you're interacting and and doing business with different uh, with different teams, but the people don't change, you know. The people don't the people move around, but they don't necessarily change. So, yeah. some of the you know some of my friends that work in the league, it's been you know twenty years. Yeah. But uh, we've been working together, and some go off to the NHL like Dave Cameron, and and then they return, Back. or they, you know you have different interactions. But uh, uh, it is a tight knit community for sure. Now you. Um... You, you were involved again with the Canada U-17 uh, 2019-2020. Uh, 
um, where again, I guess the, the Canada was split into the three teams. You were the general manager of the 67s at the same time as you were putting those teams together. How do you, how do, you do both jobs or, or do they dovetail in some way? They do dovetail together. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the responsibilities that go with the, uh, you know, the Hockey Canada job is your opinion on, you know, your opinion on uh, work that you're already doing. You know, they'll ask, so you're providing opinion on players that you've watched because it's part of your responsibilities with the 67. So I guess that's where the, 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 the knowledge base is, is, the, is the valuable commodity there. So, um, you know, it requires some additional work. Of course, there's a competition that takes place in, and uh, the under 17s in November is in Medicine Hat, Alberta and Swift Current, Saskatchewan. But once again, there's a chance to evaluate the players and, you know, keep your fingers on the pulse. So there's a benefit to, to both teams, um, you know, as these things uh, happen, as, as these tournaments happen. But also it's the interaction like we talked about, staying up to date and current on the players and the technologies and that sort of thing. Now, I know that, uh, that, that, uh... Many of the people who are viewing this are waiting for us to get to the World Juniors and the uh, and the U20 team. Although nobody knows it as Canada's U20 team, they know it as the Canada World Juniors. So you're part of the of the management group there. So I think it's time for us to spend some time talking about that. The, those people <laughs> waited patiently to get to the to the good stuff. Uh, this is a big deal for you to be part of the management team on the, on the uh, Canada World Juniors. Uh, wh what was your reaction to the appointment? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a tremendous honor, of course, and uh, it's thrilling and, uh, and reality sets in when you realize that there's really a compressed, you know, really intense period of time to select the team. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, it's exciting, but as soon as the appointment is made, the work begins and then, you know, you're immersed in it. So, it's uh, it, it's a tremendous honor for sure. And and I, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but but how were you chosen? What was the process through which you were chosen? Well, it's it's a product of working your way through the the Hockey Canada system. So the program of excellence uh, encompasses all of the national teams, and through the involvement, you know, for years I was involved in, in a GM uh, a scouting network with Hockey Canada, and then of course uh, with the under 17s. And then, uh, you know, helped out with the under 18s in a year where there was uh, under 18s didn't take place. And the natural progression is then the U20. So kind of work, you know, work my way up the Hockey Canada ladder. Um, but the, 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 U, the under 20 is the, the pinnacle uh, uh, for me of, uh, you know, that experience. Yeah. Now, you mentioned about the process of selecting the players. So let's just stay with that for a moment. Um, you're, 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 you're picking across the country, but also different leagues uh, so that, you know, the, the standard of competition may be higher or lower in different parts of the country for different leagues. How do you appraise the relative talents of players uh, from across the country? Well, that's the key is, is, you know, not just gathering the information, but how are we organizing the information? What are we doing with it? And then, you know, it's the communication amongst the management group, which, uh, you know, I work closely with Al Miller, um, you know, who manages all of the national teams is based out of Calgary and Scott Salmon, who's hockey Canada executive, uh, who, who oversees, you know, all of hockey Canada, um, the program. So we have to map out, you know, first of all, the coverage mm -hmm. and what scouts are going to what games and what, and then a criteria, what are they looking for? Mm -hmm. And then communicating with the coaching staff to come up with, you know, what are our strengths and what does the team, what do we want this team to look like? Mm -hmm. So, and then we're out looking for specific players, you know, so the way I describe it is we're not looking for a player. We're not looking for a left winger. We're looking for the left winger. Right. And where it gets a little bit more complicated is in Canada, it could really ice two teams. Yeah. You know, there's so many good players across the country. And, yeah. and as to your point, Fred, they're playing in, you know, the NCAA in the States, the yeah. vast majority are playing in the CHL, which we're familiar with. This year, due to uh, uh, accommodations for COVID, we had players playing in the American Hockey League. Yeah. Uh, so it was evaluating there. So it's knowing what are the strengths of each league? Yeah. And then how do, how do the play in those leagues translate to, 
you know, our standards. So it's a lot of traveling around. It's a lot of watching hockey. It's a lot of, uh, you know, networking and talking on the phone to different coaches and, and scouts. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm passionate about. So it's, it really is a dream role. So somebody could be the best player in a league and not be in the top 40 of all the juniors in, in the country. So you, it, it is uh, evaluating not just where they are relative to their league, but where they are relative to their peers across the country. Well, exactly. And, and you know, how do they fit in the team and what's their role on the team and, and what's their niche? So in some instances, you might be, you know, the leading scorer on a team, you know, in a league who's just a really uh, a great player, but is not a great penalty killer, might not be selected for the team. And then you can imagine when they go go to that community, how you're going to hear about it from the fans, you know, that the player wasn't selected. And, but there's so many good players that that is really the, the challenge is identifying who's going to make up the best team. And so you're looking for specific skill sets, but that's where working, you know, hand in glove with the coaching staff and the scouts and the management group to assemble the team. That's where it gets really fun. Now I have a, a couple of little grandchildren who are playing hockey and, and one of them wanted me to ask you whether you thought Owen Power was as good as he thinks he is, as good as my grandson thinks he is. Well, I think your grandson's a good scout and, uh, <laughs> and he's an exceptional player. Yeah. And you know, the one thing is, I'm familiar with Owen, of course, he, he played in uh, Mississauga, uh, his youth hockey, but yeah. uh, Owen was an accomplished lacrosse player who played really high level lacrosse, so a multi-sport athlete. And uh, so he's a tremendous hockey player, but he's also a tremendous athlete and a really, really nice, nice young guy. And the one thing he sticks about, about Owen is he's so cool and calm and collected all the time. Yeah. You know, he, nothing phases him and he doesn't get too excited and, and he's always ready to play. He's a special player. Now, I want to ask you about one of the players you chose was a 16-year-old, which is kind of unusual in a U-20 tournament. But uh, uh, Connor Bedard, uh, certainly in the, in the limited time that the series went on, proved that you'd made a good choice there. Yeah, and that was one where Connor Bedard had a, a track record with Hockey Canada, you know, playing at the, at the previous level. So he played in the World Under-18 Championship, which took place in Texas last April. And so playing uh, with, you know, a group outside his age group, he was a dominant player and really made some key plays at key times in the game. So when he came to the, you know, was identified to attend the, the tryouts for the world junior team, uh, you know, the real question mark, can, can he produce, you know, at even another level in the first scrimmage, he had four points. Wow. So he really cemented, the, you know, if there was any question of whether he could produce at that level, it was answered early on. And then he just continued to get better and better as the tournament went on. And we saw, you know, in those, in those two games that were played, uh, how dominant he can be. Oh, yeah, he was great. Now, what happens now? The, the tournament got started and then because of COVID, it got stopped or at least postponed. What does postponed mean? When should we look for the resumption? Well, they're, they're determined to complete the tournament. Uh, what that looks like, uh, that, those discussions will take place at the International Ice Hockey Federation headquarters. And, and you know, the challenge is where are they going to fit the tournament in? Yeah. You know, when the, the CHL, the Canadian Hockey League season ends, um, um, you know, you've got the Memorial Cup, which is a major event, which is scheduled. And then, you know, shortly after that, you've got the NHL draft. Yeah. And then... NHL development camps take place in, in the month of July for a lot of teams. So where do you fit that world junior tournament in? I think it's going to require some cooperation from the NHL teams and from, uh, you know, some of the, some of the leagues in Europe uh, who'd be willing to release the players, but we're optimistic and hopeful that uh, uh, they're going to be able to complete the tournament in some, in some fashion. Now, uh, if uh, I know that some of the players are already drafted, uh, you know, we talked about Owen Power, and he's already Buffalo Sabres uh, material. Um, are they likely to release him? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but but that's yeah. a challenge, I suppose. Is it that the NHL teams may not want to expose a talent like that to a tournament just before they begin their own training camp? It's a good question, and those are some of the answers. You know, those, so those are, those are some of the questions that need to be answered. Yeah. Um, keeping in mind the NHL season as long as it is, you know, that the, this is going to tack on another two weeks to it. But it's such an important tournament. I know 
you know, the, the interaction we've had with NHL teams over the course of this year, uh, they all realize the importance of the tournament for player development when it comes to not only the competition, but leadership and, uh, you know, the exposure to that high level competition, they really value it. So, uh, you know, if the tournament timing can be worked out, then I don't think the NHL teams will have an issue releasing players. And, and if some of the players that you've already uh, chosen are ineligible, I suppose you have other players that you just, you go to the next tee, plan B and, and bring other players in. Well, that's, that's where we're fortunate to have so many, you know, exceptional players in, in Canada that we've got, uh, we got a long list of players who can, uh, who can fill in, but we're hopeful that all the players, you know, the roster players from this year's world junior will be able to participate. And it was really uh, an emotional blow for those players who put in so much time and, sure. and excitement into it. So uh, we, we like every player to have that experience. James, I want to ask you, uh, just we're, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you some questions about the role of a, a general manager or part of the management team as you are GM in, in Ottawa, but, but also the World Juniors. Um, what role does the general manager play in creating the character of a team? Well, that's, that's a good question. I think that, you know, every team has different philosophies and management structures. But from my personal experience and watching other high-level organizations, what I consider to be high-level organizations, the general manager you know, influences every facet of the organization. And that's why I find it so fascinating is, you know, we're involved in the business side, you know, in ticket sales and marketing promotions. We're involved in uh, community outreach and, you know, brand management, you know, as of the, of the team and the community. And then there's a the hockey part, which is a smaller part of the day than, you know, hockey fans would imagine once you, you know, once all the uh, essentials are met. But the, for the hockey team, it's making sure you got the right personnel and staff. Mm -hmm. you know, as a coaching staff and leadership and then assembling, uh, you know, the right group of players, but it's giving everyone the tools to do the job and making sure that the lines of communication are open. So the, the analogy that I really like is it's almost like a farmer where you're providing the conditions for growth, okay. you know, and you're giving the players and the coaches everything they need. And that will give the players, you know, the best chance to, to blossom. And so if you've got a, uh, you know, you plant a seed in the ground and you, and, you, and, you, and you water it and there's sunlight and the conditions are ideal, uh, you know, you're going to get the, uh, the best plant possible. So we say the GM is like a farmer, provides conditions for growth. That's the simplest term, I think, of what you yeah. do. Well done. Well done. Now, one of the, one of the parts of your job that, that I think must be terribly frustrating is that once the puck is dropped, all you can do is watch like you're really not involved in the in the in the game once it starts right it's helpless helpless feeling at times you know <laughs> and i know when they cut to the uh, the general manager at the nhl games you know up in the box uh i can yeah. sympathize with the sometimes the facial expressions uh they're tortured watching but you know behind the scenes sometimes you're watching for different things in the game you know you might have you might have a player on the team who's been struggling maybe um, you know, with some aspect of their game or even their personal life, and you've been helping that player along with the coaching staff, and you're looking for that player to have success in the game. And so something may happen in that game that, you know, the casual fan wouldn't even realize, but you've got this heavy emotional investment in, you know, in the players that it makes it that much more exciting. But there is a, a feeling of helpless, helplessness at times, you know, when the, there's not much you can do, but, you know, be a fan. I want to just... Uh talk to you briefly about your family because I know that's an important part of your life and, and uh, we haven't mentioned them yet but uh, tell us about your wife and your kids my wife Aubrey uh, we actually live in the neighborhood in Toronto where she where she grew up or not far away yeah. uh, and uh, we have two children we have a 10 year old daughter Gemma and a seven year old daughter Phoebe and they're uh, very active young girls so uh, you say like most people who work in hockey, uh, I have a saint for a wife uh, who really, uh, uh, you, you know, manages the home front with a busy, busy schedule, uh, yeah. along with a successful career. So it's, uh, um, you know, it's a great, it's a great family and it's fun to watch them grow up. 
you have some continuing ties to Midland that uh, our viewers would be interested in. That's right. So my, mo my mother-in-law uh, and her husband live in uh, actually not far from the Midland Arena, okay. and, uh, which is a, kind of a coincidence. Uh, upon retirement, they uh, moved north like many people do yeah. and, uh, and settled in the Midland. And uh, her brother uh, uh, lives on Young Street around the corner. Uh, okay. So we return to Midland uh, often and not only to see friends that I grew up with and, and, uh, and you know, reconnect, but uh, for family events too. And you do some vacationing in this area, I understand. We try to, we try to get up there every summer and spend some time uh, uh, cottaging around the area. Uh, yeah. Tiny Beaches is a favorite um, yeah. and, and elsewhere, but uh, hopefully with a little bit of luck here, um, there could be a vacation property in the future because we just love Georgian Bay. We love the area. Midland Penetang, uh, it's a paradise for us. Well, it is for us too. So we'll look forward to uh, welcoming you to the community. James, I just want to take a, a moment to thank our viewers for, uh, for joining us, for sharing uh, this conversation with us. We um, want to also to express thanks to Rogers TV, to Madison Fitzpatrick, who is producing this program. Thanks to the MCC staff, the Midland Cultural Center. Uh, this is a program of the Midland Cultural Center, although uh, we're not able to do it in the uh, in the theater. We look forward to getting back there. But right now, we say thanks to Dan Broom and Michelle uh, Thibodeau and Victoria Evans for their support. Our season sponsors are Kathy Bales, Michelle Deshaun, and Jeff Holloway of RBC Dominion Securities. Our program sponsor for this particular program is Midland Foodland. I want to extend special thanks to... Uh, Brian McKell for, uh, for making the arrangements with James. Uh, they knew one another in the past. I also, James, want to acknowledge the OPP Association who made a contribution in your name to the Midland Cultural Center in recognition of uh, the service of your father to this community as the uh, staff commander. I want to just remind people that uh, this program is presented by the Midland Cultural Center. Usually our programs would be live. But at the time we recorded this program, the MCC was closed. So if you'd like to support the MCC, I know that they would love to uh, have you make a donation. Go to the website, click on the Donate Now button. James, this has been fun. I have really enjoyed getting to know you. I want to thank you very much for your time and for giving us uh, a bit of insight into the, into the world of hockey. Thanks very much for having me, Fred. And thanks to everyone for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. something to share let everyone know about your next meeting your need for volunteers or your fundraising event on the rogers tv community billboard send us your words and we'll bring them to life on rogers tv and rogers tv.com when it's time to spread the word go to rogers tv.com to add your announcement to the community billboard